Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Rickman. This is Plain Spoken. This is a show that I irregularly do to try and help people stay updated with developments in the United Methodist Church. I'm a local licensed pastor in the United Methodist Church, and I spend some of my time trying to understand these things, and I figured I might try and help other people try and understand. Uh, this issue right here, this this episode, is going to pertain to the resolutions adopted at Jurisdictional Conference Jurisdictional conferences were held between November 2nd and 5th around the United States, and um, they nominate and elect bishops, and they also adopt resolutions speaking for the regions they represent. So um, I'm of the South Central Jurisdictional Conference, and uh, you'll see, hopefully on an overlay, the different annual conferences that are represented in this jurisdictional conference. And we gathered in Houston, and we had several different representatives, which are represented here. We had uh, uh, several of them drop off, though, for reasons we're going to talk about uh, pertaining to Resolution 1. This episode is just only going to deal with Resolution 1. I'm going to do a couple other episodes dealing with Resolutions 2 and 3. Other jurisdictional conferences adopted very similar resolutions and sentiment. Um, what what happened at our jurisdictional conference is we lost about 30 percent, uh, maybe closer to 40 percent of our original um, representatives, delegates, because they belong to churches that disaffiliated or in the process of disaffiliation. We only had three conservatives uh, represented uh, in our entire delegation, which if you know at Oklahoma Annual Conference, if anything, excuse right, especially when you look at the laity. Even so, our representation was was pretty uh, liberal. And that was uh, shown not just in the bishops elected, but also in the uh, resolutions that we adopted. So um, if you think that this is at all relevant uh, to discerning your place in the United Methodist Church, then I'd urge you just to share this with other people so that they can see the sorts of language being adopted um, by our representative bodies. Now, the the topic, the the thing being said by a lot of people within the denomination is there is going to be room forever for people who differ theologically from one another. So, if you're evangelical traditionalist with respect to sexual ethics, you will still have a place in leadership in the United Methodist Church. That remains to be seen. Um, the, the things, the language of, of what we're adopting, does that indicate that there is going to be tolerance for a variety of views within the church? Let's see. Um, I'm going to turn a couple of times to an article written by Gina Barber. She is the editor of my conference's uh, contact newsletter. It's a, it's a monthly newsletter updating the annual conference on what's going on. She ends the article with uh, why I think this, this uh, conversation is important. Clergy and laity alike are faced with the decision of how to navigate the changes coming in the United Methodist Church. Regardless of the context, the United Methodist Church remains true to John Wesley's three simple rules for Methodists. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. So she acknowledges what everybody knows, which is that there are changes coming in the United Methodist Church. There's been long-standing conflict for four or five gener uh, decades ever since the denomination was established with respect to the liberal conservative divide. Uh, and that, of course, impacts how we see sexual ethics and behavior, but also how we interpret the Bible, uh, the hermeneutics that we employ whenever we come to the Bible with our own cultural assumptions and norms. Um, something else worth noting, um, it was Bishop Job, I believe, who summarized John Wesley's three general rules in this way. But there, the last one is, is uh, not stay in love with God. It's attend upon the ordinances of God. And there's a reason why you, you consistently see this preference for stay in love with God rather than attend upon the ordinances. Bishop Job said it's similar or the same thing. It, it's really not. One approach values the, the, the official, original biblical text and what it meant in its setting and how it can be applied today. Another is more concerned with the thematic elements of what is love, we should do love as it makes sense to us. Um, so let's look at the resolution. Uh, I could preach forever on this stuff, but this is resolution one. It's called Leading with Integrity. 
a resolution to the 2022 South Central Jurisdictional Conference. So let's look at the language here. I'll talk a little bit as we make our way through it and throughout the way be, be asking, how much does this represent uh, a denomination that has room for me? Whereas the vibrant future of the United Methodist Church requires deep commitment and loyal leadership at every level, and whereas grounded in a sense of duty and loyalty to the mission of the church, leaders are counted on and expected to make decisions about the future of the United Methodist Church with the absolute best interest of the church's Christ church at heart. And whereas the selection, election, and appointment of clergy and lay leaders throughout the United Methodist Church includes the implicit understanding that leaders will ethically serve in each of their leadership roles with the utmost integrity, and whereas leaders who do not intend to remain in the United Methodist Church entangle themselves in a significant conflict of interest, and whereas the service of a leader whose call to discipleship is aligned with the United Methodist Church is prevented by the continued leadership of an individual who has made a private decision and or public declaration to leave the United Methodist Church. Therefore, be it resolved that the South Central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church expresses both respect and gratitude to those who have voluntarily stepped away from positions of leadership as they journey away from membership in the United Methodist Church. Be it further resolved that as we continue this period of transition, the South Central jurisdiction calls upon every United Methodist as a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Christ, to move forward in fairness and with integrity. Be it further resolved that in an effort to ensure that decisions about the United Methodist Church are made by those who are wholeheartedly committed to its future, the South Central jurisdiction believes that only lay and clergy members who intend to remain in the United Methodist Church are appropriately eligible to serve in positions of leadership, including, but not limited to, local church, district, conference, jurisdictional, and general conference level committees, boards, agencies, delegations, and Episcopal leaders. We encourage conference boards of trustees to develop codes of conduct to manage conflicts of interest that may arise around discussions of disaffiliation agreements. Be it further resolved that the South Central jurisdiction asks all who intend to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church to recuse themselves from leadership roles. So this was uh, submitted by Shannon Klein, a lay delegate from North Texas. I have no idea who they are. Um, this this uh, resolution, uh, according to where you're uh, currently sitting, either sounds very fair or very problematic. Now, the fair reasoning it, it explains up here is uh, you need people who are on the side of the organization who want the organization to do well to be voting within the organization, to be influencing the future direction of the organization. Very few people would argue with that position. One of the assumptions made here is that people who are leaving to go to a more evangelical denomination or just be independent, that they don't want the UMC to do well, that they have vindictiveness in their hearts. And so if you put them in a position of power or authority, they're going to use that to harm the institution, or they're not going to be able to make decisions that, that uh, are good for the institution. One of the other assumptions made here is that there is uh, a good for the institution that may or may not correspond with a fidelity to Christ Jesus. So conservatives, evangelicals who are leaving, they're doing so because their conscience mandates that they obey Christ rather than an institution. But what, what's being mandated here is you cannot participate in the decision-making processes if your loyalty to Christ Jesus is seen through a conservative lens rather than an institutional health lens for the United Methodist Church. So that's, that's a problem. Um, another problem here, this all sounds pretty reasonable. Um, let's see, where did I have it? <clears throat> this right here is an article written by Sam Hodges on November 3rd. It talks about, at our uh, jurisdictional conference, a uh, 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 clergy named Stan Copeland. He was the one who got into it with um, Mark Tooley of the IRD. He he aired publicly a dream in which uh, not only did Mark die, but he appeared before the judgment seat of Christ and didn't do well. In my opinion, a thoroughly inappropriate and hateful thing to share publicly. Um, Stan Copeland, uh, the article here is three bishops accused of aiding disaffiliation. Stan Copeland was the one who made these 
accusations. This article describes him uh, with the support of many other people getting up in front of the jurisdictional conference and publicly uh, shaming these bishops, including my former bishop, uh, Bishop Hayes, for supposedly uh, rooting for the general, uh, the global Methodist church over the UMC, the, the notion being that because of uh, their theology and public statements they've made about um, their theology, that they have done harm to the UMC and should be officially censured by the jurisdictional conference. And so there was a robust conversation, it seems, that they had about censuring these bishops, all of whom chose not to defend themselves um, but just to let Copeland's remarks stand. The reason I highlight this is because there is um, a naked hatred on the part of left-leaning, not all left-leaning individuals, but many liberals who um, uh, really do not like right-leaning people having the gall to continue to stand in their way of social justice and liberation. When when you have leaders like Copeland who have the energy for publicly censuring not just normal people in the church, but bishops, um, uh, attacking the character and integrity. Well, integrity is the word used in this resolution, isn't it? That, that they're calling on people to have the integrity to step down if they are, uh, are not going to get with the program. So the language that... Um, that one attendee, I got a, I got a, a report from um, uh, an attendee at the South Central Jurisdictional Conference, said, in other words, those who have decided not to follow the Book of Discipline, remember the Book of Discipline currently says that homosexuality is not um, conducive to Christian faith. I, I, I should have the actual language memorized by now, but it, it, that it doesn't fit. You know, we don't have nasty language of abomination, going to hell. We just have language of it doesn't fit. Those who have decided not to follow the Book of Discipline, the liberals who, who joined the denomination knowing what our theological stance was and joined anyway, who said that they supported our Book of Discipline but actually have been working against it, they are asking that those... Um, are asking that those who do um, follow the Book of Discipline to show some integrity and leave. And this resolution passed by 82% by a vote of 138 to 30. So this this is, uh, I, I, I can't really disagree with, with the way that she summarized that. I, I think it it makes it pretty black and white about whether or not this is a, a good resolution to take up. But the problem I have here is that this this notion of covenant and that the covenant community's job is to have a holy conversation a holy if we're going to disagree we have to do it with integrity now does integrity mean that while you're in the covenant you drop out and eliminate your voice from the conversation i don't think that's really how a covenant community works i think while you're in covenant you have a right to representation are you a part of the covenant or not. So what, what the liberal faction would want is these conservatives who are currently in the covenant do not have a voice in any collective decision making. That essentially, if their hopes or aspirations are to eventually leave this covenant community, that they go ahead and silence themselves even though they're still a part of the covenant community. So the reason I, I'm, I'm making this distinction is there are a lot of congregations, a lot of people within the UMC who want to leave, but they can't because they can't afford to. The only provision for exit of our denomination is paragraph 2553, where in order to leave, a bare minimum that you pay is unfunded pension liabilities plus two years of apportionments. A lot of churches cannot afford that. So essentially what's happening is they're being asked to, to stay in an organization that they don't want to be in and are not going to be represented in either. And this, this call, this, this resolution that was put forward, it, it doesn't just say that there shouldn't be representative on, on the general conference or jurisdictional. It's saying on every level, we're calling upon people to step down if their hearts are no longer with the United Methodist Church. Now that, as I said in the beginning, makes a certain kind of sense, but essentially what you're doing what percentage of the denomination do you think is evangelical conservative and doesn't really want to be tied to this body that's increasingly liberal? I, I think when you look at reporting by UM News done before COVID, when you look 
I think soberly at the denomination, more than half the people in the pews really don't want to be a part of what the UMC is is choosing to do ideologically, theologically. I think at least 25% of our clergy don't want to be a part of that. But what's happening now is that their voices are going to be removed from decision-making. And whenever you read reports from liberals who attended uh, jurisdictional conferences that uniformly uh, elected liberal bishops and passed liberal pieces of legislation, they're not saying, oh, we really miss the voices of our evangelical brothers and sisters. Rather, they are so happy. They, they, they're talking about what a a refreshing experience it is. Oh, it's a new day in, in the United Methodist Church. They're not sad to see us go. They're happy to see us stay if we pay our bills and shut up. But um, I, I, I wonder if it might be uh, fictitious to imagine that there is a long-term UMC where evangelical traditionalist conservative voices are represented or appreciated or made room for. Um, Practically speaking, this is already having a huge effect in my annual conference, say. Uh, there are many boards and committees that exercise a lot of um, power and authority over local churches. When you talk about the Council of Finance and Administration, uh, when you talk about the Board of Ordained Ministry, when you talk about the Board of Trustees, these make material, real decisions that affect local churches. And what's happened in each of these boards and committees is they were previously represented pretty equally by traditionalists and liberals. But since conservative churches have started disaffiliating, traditionalists have left these boards and committees. And what's happening with this resolution now is saying essentially that traditionalist conservatives should not really be considered for taking the places of those who have left. The only legitimate uh, replacements are people who are with the UMC no matter what direction it goes, who who are not going to be um, uh, entertaining the notion of being able to leave if the UMC makes some unbiblical decisions. So this essentially uh, guarantees a monopoly of liberals leading not just at the top, but at every level of church leadership along the way. So essentially you have assets, real estate, um, in the trust of an annual conference or a general conference now that is going to be uniformly liberal. And at a certain point, um, people are who are not getting with the program, not just leadership, but people in the pews are going to be invited to leave if they cannot, will not get with the program. Um, I think that this resolution indicates a huge sea change in the uh, denomination. And I, I think it's much harder to to believe the notion that there's going to be a place for conservatives after things like this are adopted with uh, an 82 percent margin we're gonna I, I don't know what is going to keep this in check especially as something like the christmas covenant we'll get that to that in resolution two in the next installment but if we pass something like that we're not even going to be able to receive correction from people outside of the uh, united states of america we're just going to be our own insular uh, party that's increasingly liberal and increasingly intolerant of conservative thought. So, um, like I said, if you think that this was a helpful thing to do, making the way through the resolutions and looking at a couple of other things, go ahead and share this uh, with anyone. I, I think it's pertinent throughout the connection, but especially in the South Central jurisdiction. If there are people you don't think know what decisions were made, what resolutions adopted, go ahead and send this to them. Make sure they know. All right. God bless you. I'll see you later.